Yeah, amen. Let's just pray real quick. Holy Spirit, thank you for the work you've done tonight. Thank you for the ministry in this place. And Lord, we just pray right now that you would come with a sickle, Father, of transformation and cut off in us whatever needs to be cut off so that we can glorify you through our lives on this earth. In Jesus' name, amen. And it's so fitting uh, to be laying hands and uh, essentially ordaining a mother and a father of the house uh, because I just felt as we were worshiping um, to really key in on the concept of God the Father, okay? And I'm not going to take a lot of time uh, talking, so I would like to, I would like to um, impart that revelation through laying on of hands for you if you'd like to receive that. Uh, but we were seeing that, that word Abba, and Chris eloquently said it's an intimate way to say father. Really, it means daddy, right? But it's kind of hard to say daddy God because now it gets made fun of online. Like you go through the reels and, you know, uh, what's a senior global pastor? Like <laughs> daddy God. It's, it's funny. It really is. Uh, but it's really what it means. It means daddy. It's, it's an intimate way of, of coming close to God and laying your head in his bosom and saying, this is my father. This is who I'm called to, to, to not only know as God Almighty, which he is, you really should have a healthy fear of God and a healthy understanding that the, 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 the Father is God Almighty, amen? And that fear of the, of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, okay? But that's where we begin, and you're not called to finish where you begin, are you? No, in fact, as we come into that revelation that the, the fear of the Lord is where we start, we actually are transported from that place of the fear of God into knowing God as a father and then relating to him as a son or daughter would relate to their intimate daddy. Amen? In fact, this is what Jesus modeled in, in uh, the gospel uh, of Luke and Matthew when he was being baptized at the Jordan River. How many of you know, realize Jesus didn't need to be baptized, did he? No, of course not. He's perfect. He doesn't need to, to have his sins washed. He doesn't need that process. But what does he say to John when John goes, I'm not even worthy to bend down and untie your sandals. Jesus says, we must do all that man requires. In essence, he's saying, although I don't really need this, I want to demonstrate to everybody else that will come after me that this is important. And that this is a necessary part of the process of becoming a part of who God has called you to be. And so what happens is Jesus is baptized. And of course, when we, when we think about that in the traditional sense, we kind of key in on the fact that he was water baptized, right? He goes down and then he comes up. But in fact, baptism is more than just remission of sin, which is important. It doesn't need to be diminished. We don't need to overlook that fact. It's more than that. It's actually three part, right? So, in fact, Jesus goes down into the water, symbolizing his death. He comes up out of the water, symbolizing his resurrection into the new life. The Spirit of God comes upon him like a dove and recognize that the Holy Spirit is not a dove, but came gently upon Jesus with power as if he were a dove. And then there's a third part, which is probably the most overlooked part in all of church tradition in the West which is the skies opened up and a voice from heaven spoke over Jesus in a third part of the baptism. Just like God is three parts, he's triune. There's a triune um, relationship in baptism. The skies open up and God baptizes him once again in his voice. And what does he say over him? This is my son and I'm well pleased. And that's, really kind of revel revelatory because up until this point, all Jesus has done is grow up as a boy into a man, right? And in fact, without this understanding, you really can't grow in Christ. Without the understanding that the, the, the point of being a Christian is knowing God as a father and relating to him as a son or a daughter, without that, you can't be a follower of Christ. In fact, remember when Jesus is in John 3, he's sitting with Nicodemus, the religious teacher, and he says, Nicodemus, he just comes in hot. That's how Jesus does it. He's just bold with his words. He says, Nicodemus, 
In order to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must what? Be born again. And of course, Nicodemus is in the flesh, so he's like, what is this dude talking about? How am I going to climb up back in there? I'm too big, I'm too long, I'm too wide. I can't be born again. And Jesus goes, no, no, no. You're confused because your carnal mind doesn't understand. You must be born of water and the spirit, right? Because think about this with me. What happens when a new baby is born into this world? Yeah, you break through water, right? So let's go back to that picture of baptism. Jesus goes down into the water, he comes up, and he breaks through water. (laughs) <laughs> and then what happens from that point? Usually if there's a doctor or a midwife or some sort of healthcare professional, they come down, they scoop you up, and then they kind of like, they used to like flip babies upside down and spank them a little bit, right? Does anybody, anybody remember that? You guys, mate. <laughs> they don't do that anymore, but what's the point of that? They want the baby to take its first, first breath of air, just like the Holy Spirit comes upon our hearts, just like it was demonstrated with Jesus and breathes into us and reanimates us and creates a new life within us. And then the third part, which again, we overlook, we don't think about, the baby is then placed on the breast of the one who would then care for that baby its entire life. <laughs> Just like Jesus demonstrated, the Spirit not only creates a new life in us, but actually transports us, as Galatians 3 says, that we would connect to the Father, the provider, the nurturer, the the person who would care for us our entire lives, and nuzzle close into him and know him intimately as a child would know a father. And so to be a Christian you got to be reborn. In fact, I want you to understand this. This is what this means to be a new creature in Christ. When you confess Christ as your Lord, you didn't do that on your own. 1 Corinthians 12 says this, that when you said Christ is Lord, it was a work and a miracle of the Holy Spirit moving within your, your body, within your spirit, resurrecting you. That, that at one point in your life, when you confess Christ, You were Joe, the guy who didn't know Jesus, but then in that moment, you were reborn. You're a new creation. You're a new creature. There's actually a gravestone that stands where your old life once was, where you then confessed Christ, and you were reborn through the power of the Spirit into a new reality that you are a son, you are a daughter of God. So when you try to think about the shame of your old life, what you're actually doing is taking a shovel of your flesh and digging up the old person. You're trying to rob the grave. You're trying to go backwards and say, I want to go back into that old, rotten, dead body. I want to be who I used to be. You're not that person anymore. You were reborn by the power of the Spirit. You're a new being. You're a new creation. And learning to do that is learning to be close to God. It's learning to experience Him. You know, five years, no, six years ago now, when we were a, a tiny little Methodist church in Livingston, We were just asking God, we need vision. We need to know what you want us to do. We need to know who we're called to be. And a group of us, uh, some leaders in the church, heard God say, I'm calling you to bring freedom to Appalachia. I'm calling you to bring freedom to Appalachia. I didn't even know what Appalachia, I thought it was a trail. I thought it was just like something you took a hike on. Bring granola bars, watch out for bears, that sort of thing. So we did a little research. Appalachia is a region of the United States. We're in Appalachia right now. Appalachia, Appalachia, tomato, tomato, potato, potato, same thing. You're in it right now. It's a a region of America. 25 million people live here. It's probably the most Christian, traditional region in the whole United States. And like thinking about that, like, God, why would you call us to this region where everybody knows who Jesus is? In fact, if you were born here, like I was born or not born here, you probably have heard the gospel inside and out. You've known Jesus since the day you could think. You've said Jesus since the day you could talk. Jesus has just been part of who you are as you've grown up. But as we've begun to to pray and, you know, I meet other churches who have the same heart for freedom and being a part of Breath of Heaven 
is, is just like incredible because these people have the same cry for freedom in Appalachia. As we began to pray and talk to people, we, we found out really quickly that most everybody in Appalachia knows who Jesus is, but hasn't let Jesus come and know who they are. And so there's this great dichotomy where there's a lot of people who know the, the way of salvation, but are still stuck in their brokenness. Because I wanna, I wanna tell you something, you can be saved and depressed. You can be saved and full of fear. You can be saved and addicted. You can be saved and miserable. It's only through encountering God and knowing him as a father and letting him know you and letting him break things off of your life that you were never meant to live with that we become delivered from who we never were supposed to be and become transformed into the image of Christ who modeled what? Sonship on the earth. And so we have a region of 25 million people who know Christ, who know the way of salvation, but are living in torment and brokenness because they've not figured out or they've not received the revelation that being a Christian is actually knowing God as a father. <laughs> There's a story in Judges 11 about a guy named Jethpath. Who's ever read that story? It's crazy. It's a really weird story. Jethpath, uh, let, me, let me see if I could just read a little bit from it. Judges 11. Now, Jephthah, verse 1, the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor, but he was a son of a harlot, which means a not great lady. <laughs> And Gilead begot Jephthah. Jeth Gilead's wife bore sons, and where his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, you shall have no inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brothers and dwelt in the land of Tob, and worthless men banded together with Jephthah and went out raiding with him. So we've got this, this, this soon-to-be hero, Jephthah, and Jethpath has a rough upbringing. He's born of a different mother than his sons. His mom was a working lady. And so she made her money in uh, disreputable means. And so as he's growing up, the rest of his brothers begin to pick on him and tease, on, tease him and ostracize him. And they send him away and they say, you know what, get out of, a, get out of our home. You shall have no uh, uh, part of the inheritance that's been set aside for us. So Jephthah is, is outcast, he's become an orphan, and he goes to Tob, and he begins to make a way for himself by raiding nearby villages. He's got, it says, a worthless band of brothers that begin to come around him, and he begins to figure out that he's a good warrior, that he's strong, that he can take care of himself, that he can do what he needs to do to get by, and he doesn't have to wait and, and, and rely on anybody else. Now on the, the surface, that seems like a pretty good gig, doesn't it? Yeah, of course, I wanna be self-sufficient. I, I think that's actually part of Appalachia. Like, we like to be self-sufficient. We like to do things ourselves. We like to be left alone, don't, I mean, I know I do. And so Jethpath is having this, this, this development in his life where he, he's been orphaned by his brothers. He's been outcast, and so he's learning to be his own savior. It says later on in the story that Israel is under attack from Ammon and Jephthah's brothers go back to Jephthah because they hear he's a great warrior and they're like, hey Jephthah, if you'll come fight for us, if you'll come lead us into battle against Ammon, we'll let you be our king and you can come back into the fold and be one of us and also be our ruler. Well, what do you think an orphan man like Jephthah thinks about that? He's like, yeah, that's a good deal. I'm going to do that. So he approaches the King Ammon. He says, King Ammon, I'm going to fight you. There's a back and forth dialogue. And then as Jethpath is going out to war, he, he makes a commitment to God. He says, God, I'm going to war. And if I go to war and you give me victory, when I get back home, I'll give you the first thing that comes out of my house. Of course, he goes to war. He wins. He goes home. Lo and behold, what comes out of his house? His daughter. What an idiot. It says it's the only kid he's got. He's, the, he's a, a, a dad of a, of a single kid, and he, he's committed to sacrificing his daughter to God. It actually says that she comes out with a tambourine first. So in my head, 
uh, uh, technically, the tambourine was first. Get rid of that thing. We don't like tambourines anyways, do we? <laughs> Just kidding. If you like tambourines. Chris likes tambourines. Okay. Retract that. And so it says his daughter comes out shaking a tambourine, and he rips his, his shirt, his tunic, and he cries, no, why? And of course, he tells his daughter... And, uh, you know, instead of running as fast as she can, she's a really humble kid. She goes, Dad, do what you have to do to honor God. And he sacrifices his daughter. Isn't that weird? Why would he do that? Why would he make that choice? Why would he make that vow? Why would he follow through with that? I want to point something out to you. Through the entire story of Jephthah, not once did God speak to him on what he should do. And the reason God didn't speak to him one time is because Jephthah didn't go to God for direction. You see, everything Jephthah did was a product of his orphan upbringing. He did things to fight for himself. He did things to provide for himself. And so in this instance, nothing changed. And I want to tell you something. God still saved the people of Israel through Jephthah because even in the midst of religious areas, the message of of salvation is still strong. God still saves people. But Jephthah is bound by an orphan spirit. And so because all he knows is to fight for himself, he doesn't know how to come to God. He doesn't know how to to say, Lord, what are you doing in this moment? Are you calling me to be king? Are you asking of anything from me? And instead, he tries to prove himself to God by giving up everything he thinks he has control over in order to prove who he is before God. That's an orphan spirit. And so we see in this moment, Jephthah, this strong, mighty, self-sufficient probably a little angry and angsty guy is brought to ruins because his orphan spirit has given way to religious activities. See, you can do things in the name of God, but if God has not called you to do them, you will bring destruction into your life and the people that you love's lives around you. Wow. Instead, we have to be willing to say, God, you know what? I don't want to provide for myself. I don't want to be my own champion. I don't want to do things my way. I want to know you, know what you're doing in my life, be connected to your heart, know you as a father, and move when you move so that I don't make a mistake that brings destruction into what I'm called to steward. See, religion always feels satisfying to the flesh, doesn't it? It always feels like you're doing something good and productive and you're striving in the right direction, but that's just the thing. You're striving and a work of the flesh will always bring destruction onto itself. (laughs) See, in John 20, 20, after Jesus uh, is crucified, it says that the disciples, they're scared and they're hiding in a room with the door locked because they know the, the enemy is out to get them and they don't know what to do. And it says in that place of fear and hiding that Jesus shows up before them. And what does he do? He shows them his scars and the wounds on his side. And they become amazed and filled with joy because they realize Messiah's back. Jesus' presence shows up. And it's from that place of his presence, what does he do next? He blows on them. And imparts the Holy Spirit into their lives. And then he commissions them. He says, whoever you forgive will be forgiven. Whoever you withhold forgiveness to will not be forgiven. And really what he's saying, he's saying, I'm giving you the message of reconciliation. What I did on the cross was to reconcile sons and daughters back to the Father. And I'm commissioning you to go preach the same message to the world around you. But wait a second. These guys are afraid. They're locked behind a door. What's changed? God's presence. Jesus' presence has showed up. And look, we don't come to just experience the presence because the presence makes us feel good, although it does. Goosebumps are fun. Laughing is fun. Dancing is fun. Singing is fun. Clapping your hands is fun. But that's not the point. See, when God's presence comes, his spirit begins to blow. His breath begins to pour out on us. He begins to touch our spirits with his spirits. And an impartation happens where we become whole, where we were once broken because the power of the spirit begins to heal the places of our orphan tendencies. 
So it's the breath of God that comes into our life when we encounter his presence that makes us something that we could not be in our old self that only is possible through a new birth. (laughs) All we have to do is receive. See, this is why this ministry is so powerful because the point of what you all do here is not to preach fancy messages, it's not to sing really good music, it's not to do ministry really well, it's to get in the presence of God. Because when we get in the presence of God, his spirit becomes available to us. <laughs> this is why I like be running with Chris and Jessica. This is why I like running with the Els... Els Mizmas. Stan and Linda. Because these guys have the same heart. They, want, they don't want to just do ministry. They don't want to just live like Jeff Path, doing things for themselves. They want to be connected to God's heart. They want to not just run in any which direction to wear themselves out. They want to hear God's voice for themselves. They want to say, Jesus, what do you want to do in my life? What do you want to use me for? How do you see me best fitting into your plan? And then show me how to step into it. They want to be sons and daughters. See, so often we just want to do things that make us feel good because we think it honors God. And if you don't relate to him as a father, you don't know him. Oh my gosh, I'm not talking about your salvation. That's up to him. It's not my job to tell you whether you're saved or not. What I'm telling you is, is he's not trying to just be your Messiah. He's not just trying to be your king, which he is. He wants to be your father. He wants to be Abba. And you actually have to jump into that. How many of you have ever done a cannonball into like a refreshing river on a hot day? Right? You get ready. I'm going to go do it. And you're about to jump. And right as you're about to jump, what do you do? (gasps) Splash. And then you go down. And then you come up. (sighs) Let's do that together. (gasps) Abba, Abba, you have to jump into the refreshing river of your father. You have to say, God, I know I'm broken. I know I'm ashamed of myself. I know that my life doesn't make sense. I know who I am, but I want to know who you are because I want to jump into the river of Abba. I want to jump into the refreshing stream of knowing a father. I, want, I would like to, is it okay if I pray for people? I'd like to pray for you. Would you stand up with me? And maybe we'll get some, some worship music. I spent most of my youth and what little adult life I've had trying to prove myself to myself and to the people around me. That's exhausting. You know what happens after a season of doing that two or three times? You break. You fall apart. You come out of yourself because you realize, I just can't do it anymore. I just can't fake it anymore. I just can't be my own God. I actually have to know who I am and what I was created for. And it begins with saying, God, I need to know you as a son or a daughter knows a father. I need to know you as a child comes to a loving parent. So right now, I would just like you to get into a posture of receiving. Whatever that looks like for you. I don't, you know, put your hands out, put them up, put them to the side, tickle your friend's face. It doesn't matter. Whatever it looks like for you. And I just want you to pray this prayer to yourself. How, however you need to say it in your own heart. Lord Jesus, we make space for your presence again right now. We make space right now for your presence. Lord Jesus, we recognize that you're in this room, that you're dwelling among us, just as you were dwelling with the disciples in John 20, 20, as even though they were afraid, even though they were broken, even though they were ashamed, you're right here with us despite our iniquity. You're here dwelling among us. We thank you, God. We thank you, God, that you show up despite who we are. You show up because, God, the only thing you've ever desired is for us to know you first 
but then for you to be allowed in to know us. So Jesus, would you come and would you see who we are? Would you breathe upon us? Would you release your spirit upon us? Father, and as it says in Galatians, as the spirit is released into our lives, we are prompted to call out Abba, Father. So Lord, right now we confess with our hearts, with our mouths, with our minds, with our spirits, you are our daddy. You are our God. You are our father. You are our provider. Would you come and would you release this into our hearts? Would you release this into our spirits? Lord, maybe we've not seen the perfect image of a father naturally in our lives. God, maybe we've been let down. Maybe we've been betrayed by our earthly fathers. But God, right now we choose despite that to come to you right now as Father God. As Father God. We come to you as a child comes to a parent right now as Father God. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I command the, the orphan spirit to leave this place. Go right now. Get out. You have no permission. You have no authority. We cast you down right now. Get out in the authority of Jesus. And Father, as we come to you, we pray that the spirit of adoption would fall once again on each of our hearts, God, that we would open ourselves to you to confess, to cry out, Abba, God, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.